Welcome to the EMEA Recruitment Podcast, produced in partnership with Operation Smile. We're proud to support Operation Smile through raising vital funds and awareness for their work in providing life-changing surgery for children born with cleft lip and palate around the world. In this special episode, we're delighted to speak to Kathy McGee, the President and CEO of Operation Smile, which she co-founded with her husband in 1982. Kathy spoke to Paul Toms ahead of the release of his first children's book, Slow Thar the Slow, from which all profits will be donated to Operation Smile. So, hello everybody. Welcome to the next episode of the EMEA Recruitment Podcast, sponsored in partnership as, as ever with uh, our good partners over at Operation Smile. And uh, delighted to welcome Kathy McGee onto the show. So, a very, very special guest uh, we have today. So, hopefully, you can still hear and see me okay, Kathy. Yes, I can. I'm so excited to be here. Um, just looking at what all you do for people and clients uh, to make sure things are in order in different offices. So kind of that's what Operation Smile does. We take care of people, but we have to make sure it's quality, it's it's the right procedure, and we're very safe. We're very strong on the safety with these children because they've never been to a hospital. The families have never been in, so they're, they're afraid of what's gonna happen and that our teams are so great. We put our arms around these children and their families and take care of them to the best of our ability. So I'm so glad to be here today. Nice, right, excellent. And I've got to say, we're, we're probably on our 200th uh, episode of the podcast show, and uh, I'm never normally nervous before, before coming into a podcast, but today I, I think I am a bit. I mean, obviously a little <laughs> bit in awe of what, what yourself and your husband have done, uh, you know, with the charity and how you've all started it and where, where it is today. And these are obviously all things that will come up in the in the line of uh, questions uh, today. So I'm really looking forward to it. And again, uh, yeah, huge thanks for spending the time with us today to go, go through these. And um, I I think that the first question that I ask every guest coming on to the, the podcast, given that, you know, the show is in partnership with uh, your Operation Smile, uh, is that, you know, what was the last thing that made people smile? So I thought, actually, that it would be a bit crazy not to ask you this question, given uh, given the company you founded and so on. So what was the last thing that's, that made you smile, Cathy? Well, you know, I always I have lots of grandchildren and we deal a lot with children and I have a pediatric nursing background. So for me to have a child giggle and smile when I hold them, for me, that's the best thing that can ever happen. And when we bring them in and out of surgery and to see that change in that child and that smile on that child's face after different years of not being able to do that then that, that makes my day, honestly. And then my family and staff ask me, what keeps me up at night? And I say, we just need to take care of more children. They're out there and we need to do this. So that smiling on that child's face is so important to me. Uh, that's it's it's great to hear, and I, I know obviously uh, coming up here, well, there's a few questions aligned to the missions that you guys do, and the uh, um, yeah the, the the great work you do, but also some of the challenges associated with this uh, as well. And um, I mean, I know obviously this is um, you know looking back quite a while ago now when you started Operation mm-hmm. Smile, but to today you you look and see what it what it's like, what you've achieved, and I thought I'd ask you what it feels like to be uh, in in this position now in the in the business well you know we slowly have taken steps forward right we see a problem how do we address the problem and so for me now i can actually address the problem and say we're going to take care of that problem whatever that may be um and i we are talking more about getting closer to the patient. This is so important because we see families all the time. They don't have any shoes on their feet and they will walk for miles and miles and days to get to us. So I can make these decisions saying, okay, let's take a look, not just at doing the surgery for that child. Let's look at that whole family and look at the needs and get out to where the people are. So I can make decisions now that I could suggest before, but now I can say, all right, let's get the team and let's see how we're going to make it happen. So that, that's that been a great thing. You know, it's a lot of responsibility because you know it's a life that you're actually changing. 
you know, how many times do we get to be able to change a child's life? Not so many. And so people are willing to commit and help us to do that. So I feel like those decisions now and those responsibilities are on me and I have to make this move for the future to take care of more people and more children. So yeah, it's been a lot, but uh, yeah, we're just gonna do it. That's the way it is, you know? <laughs> we know what we can do. We have a, a certain ability to be able to do this surgery. And we know there are lots of children out there with you know, a cleft lip and cleft palate. It can be changed. They can have a life. They can eat, they can speak, they can go to school, they can you know, have friends and not be made fun of. This is a big deal for a child. So I feel like we have that. I now have taken the responsibility to make sure we do more and we get to more children. And it's, and it's, I mean, obviously, as someone who was born with cleft lip and palate myself, uh, you know, in, in the UK here, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, we take it for granted that these operations are available and, and don't really think uh, too much uh, about them in, in the developed okay. world. But in the developing countries, you know, the, 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 the skill set just uh, isn't there largely. And I think, as you mentioned there, someone's someone's life can be quite a miserable existence if, if they don't get this uh, situation uh, worked on. And so, yeah, I think, uh, as you as you mentioned in in the answer to the first question you know what makes you smile is seeing you know the smile and laughter with the, the children and that you help and the people around you and, and it's so giving the gift of the smile to children i mean it's uh you know it, it doesn't get much better than that i guess uh, you know for in terms of uh, job satisfaction i suppose if you want to put it that way <laughs> you know i agree with you we we take certain things for granted you know in our developed countries in Europe, in the United States, you you know get an appointment, you go to a doctor. That is not happening out there in probably 85% of the world. And so, you know, we feel like we're privileged to be able to help to change that ability to get some medical attention, to have a healthier life. Um, it's it's a lot going on, but we're going to try to do it so we train the people, whether it's anesthesia, pediatricians. We train, change the whole team and train them so that they can do more in that um, uh, district hospital, we're calling it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I guess, you know, taking you back to 1982 when you, you decided <laughs> to, to start the business, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, obviously you know, starting business with you, with your husband, Dr. Bill McGee. And, and, and I guess, you know, the question that, that I had is why specifically uh, cleft lip and palate. Was was there any reason behind this uh, yeah, specialism at that time? Well, I have a pediatric nursing background, and my husband is a pediatric plastic surgeon, and he has a dental and a medical degree plus his plastic surgery. So he concentrates on on this area of the face and he knows the dental he knows all that area from having the dental background and so he started you know here in the united states with a practice so he got very good at you know taking care of cleft lip cleft palate not as many as we see every day on in the you know um middle middle countries that ha don't have this ability so he we we went for the first time and were asked to go to the Philippines. We had no idea, no idea what we were about to see. And we we jumped to islands, there's 7,000 islands in the Philippines. So we jumped islands, took care of kids, cleft lip, cleft palate, and it was fast. And our, the last island we were in, honestly, we there was 15 of us. We were overwhelmed, 300 children surrounded us and their families 15 of us in the middle of this lecture hall and you know we were literally in tears the 15 of us because we knew we couldn't touch it couldn't even touch it so we said well let's organize let's do the best we can and uh take care of as many as we can and that trip alone we just did 40 out of all those kids so you know for us to leave it just didn't feel good because we knew we could take care of it. And that's where we really started saying on the plane back, what could we do to really go back? We thought and just finish those children. And here we are 40 years later. I mean, uh, we had no idea all this, 
all of the cleft lip and cleft palate all over this world. Uh, so that really got us started. And also at that time, because I have the five children, I took our oldest daughter out, Bridget, and I taught her how to scrub in an OR. I have no idea. She was 13 years old. So I just say to everybody, get your kids moving because they're so capable. <laughs> and um, my husband said, OK, good. Put another table on and I'll have Bridget be my scrub nurse. And so we were able to do instead of three tables, we could do four. And we did an extra 15 children at that time. So kids, they've got it. They will do what you show them how it can be done. And they do it very, very well. So I say, get your kids involved. It was so important for us because now schools started clubs in country, in the US, in Europe. And those students are very important to us. They are, first of all, they're a future. Second of all, they're very capable on these teams and they teach these kids important things. How do you take care of your teeth? What do you do if you're dehydrated? All these things, what do you eat so you're healthy? They are very capable and we say just get those students involved mm. so anyway that trip we learned a lot the first time and tried to move forward and then people started asking us could we go to kenya could we go to south america could we and we kept saying oh okay we never said no no is not an answer in here we would always <laughs> say well let's find some friends let's see because we network with the Plastic Surgery Society worldwide, and we had friends from living all over the world. So we started really pushing on these different countries and saying, here. And once somebody else went, they told their friends. They said, hey, this is the best thing to do. You were very good at cleft lip and cleft palate. Let's go. You can go to this other country with me. So now we have 6,000 volunteers ready to go. And so for us, that's so important. Best volunteers, we credential them, whether it's the surgeon, the anesthesia, the intensivists, all those people, biomed, uh, nobody thinks about them, but if we don't have our equipment working, we're in trouble. So we always have a biomed person on our teams. So anyway, it's a team of a strong five that we always put on these sites and make sure it works to the best of the ability for these kids. And I mean, you mentioned there the, the benefits that the children get from being on these on these missions. Uh, and, and I think that that's even more exaggerated in, in the modern world that we're in now, you know, I mean, because obviously yeah. it's such a, you know, there's so many, so much emphasis now in, in front of the screen, uh, you know, taking people away from, you know, really building what you class as uh, real relationships. It's very easy for children to stay in front of a screen all day and uh, and yeah. uh, not really notice. Uh, you know that they're not communicating with real people. But this way, it's not only they're communicating with people. It's very emotional uh, as well, and it, and it, it kind of builds uh, their strength on the emotional side and the empathy side and uh, and, and and gratitude as well. I would say is a big mm, part. Yeah, of that. They're grateful for what they they have. So there's a lot that children are gonna are gonna get from this. And, and kind of this is leading me on to my next question because I know that, that you're, as you mentioned earlier, your family are, and children are very involved in uh, in Operation Smile. I mean, you, you so you have five five children, uh, fourteen grandchildren, and and <laughs> that largely all of them are pretty active in in the uh, in the Operation Smile business. And I was going to say, you know, what what impact has I guess being a, a mother, being a grandmother, had on how you've shaped Operation Smile as a business? Because I'd imagine it's had quite a large impact on that. You're working with children every day, your family a big part of it. But, you know, do you think there's anything specific that, you know, that, that jumps out to you as the impact that, you know, having five, having this large family is and uh, being involved in, in the family business has really had on, on the company and so on? Uh, yes, I, I, I don't, you know, we never really um, thought about saying, oh, hey, uh, to our kids, hey, maybe in the future you'll you'll come in and help us out. But what we did was we had patients. If we had a, a larger craniofacial case, we couldn't do it in country. We had to bring it to the U.S. or to Europe. So we would have those patients living in our house. And so my kids would say, "Well, where where are they going to sleep?" And I'd say, "Well, how about your bed?" <laughs> and so they would have to get out of their bed. I'd give them the room. I said, don't worry about it. We'll fix everything later. And then 
a couple of them, I said, well, take them to school with you. They were like, whoa, what are you kidding me? <laughs> and because they had, you know, either tubes in their nose or something like that, and they were, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you're just going to be fine. I called the headmaster. They're totally fine. Bring that student. Some of them were, you know, like 14 years old. Some of them were younger and they took them to school with them. And the school was excited. The kids there were excited. So actually they were rewarded for doing that. And um, so just having patients in our house, having them live with it and, um, you know, and then taking them out with us. Very important. Uh, that's why I'm saying hey, maybe you can go with your son because what happened, and I'll tell you this one story. My daughter took out her, took her oldest son, um, and I think they were in Colombia, and uh, they went to a village. So they had to cross a river to get to this child's house or hut, and uh, they were doing some speech ther therapy to follow the surgery. And on the way back, my my grandson turned around. He's not small. He's he's like almost six feet. He's a sophomore in high school. And he just threw his arms around my daughter and said, started crying and said, I had no idea people lived like this. I had no idea, mom. And so that's what exposure did for them. They learned to be grateful for what they have every day. They can do you know, have fun, have ability to do all sorts of things, maybe ski, maybe hike. And these kids have nothing. So they learn to appreciate what they had and to also give back. That was the one thing I wanted. Like, we should share what we have. You'll never lose. Just share what, what you have. You have talents. You have time. Share those things with people. And so it got to be a big family peace and everybody is involved. And I have never asked my kids to take a position or do something. They have always volunteered to do it because they live with it. I think they just lived with it and they just got involved and saw the needs and they took special things that they could do to make those changes. My oldest one that went the first time, she handles all the student programs worldwide. That was 40 years ago. 40 years ago, so she's 50s um, and she's still doing it. So you realize what you can do and you realize you can give back and you realize you're changing a child's life, but you're also changing this world to be a better place to be. So we learned a lot by doing this and uh, yeah, it's a great family activity. No, it's, it's really interesting because I suppose um you know, I suppose when you're looking more at the um, uh, a career path of, of let's say a, a standard individual, if they're moving mm -hmm. around careers mm -hmm. that, uh, or they start a, a business in a uh, in a in the private sector, they might the uh, public sector, they may say, well, you know, working with uh, husbands, wives, family members is, mm -hmm. is something to to potentially avoid. You know, there's not many people yeah. that would recommend it. But obviously, for yourselves, it seems to have gone extremely well. I mean, did, and did you? Do you think that you could you imagine Operation Smile without having your your family involved? Um, I really, I don't. I really think it was something that we could all do together, right? There are some things you can do together. Um, I don't know. It could be cooking, it could be hiking, but this thing we can do together. And you know, my kids are everywhere. There, one is in LA, one is in Colorado, one is in Utah. So we can still all do something together. And so, um, you know, we we did learn a lot by doing this. And I have to say, you have to realize what your talent is, right? My uh, husband is a visionary. He'll say, and. One of the things we can talk about, uh, different things we did to get involvement from others. And he, he has a vision, and he, but the vision is big. And I'm like, okay, that's a great idea, but who's going to make it happen? So I'm on the other side of this and saying, okay, so the way we could implement this, because ideas are only ideas if you implement them. And so I'd say, well, let me get the team together. Let's sit down. You can share your ideas. We have to have the people to make it possible. So I'll just give you one example, which was a big one for us. 
we said we have to do something to make noise, to get some ideas out there for these countries so they could get more corporate involved, raise money to do more, uh, more volunteers involved. And so um, we read this chapter called, it's called BHAG, A Big, Hairy, Audacious Goal. Okay. And we, we read that chapter and we we're like, all right, well, what are you going to do? So we said we could go around the world. And I mean, this was not happening in a day, but we could go around the world to 18 countries. We were already in them nine weeks and we would operate on 5,000 children. And then my, my, my husband had another idea because Pat Robertson is here. Uh, Christian Broadcasting. They were all over the world. We went over and met with Pat. He'd been a donor, but he had an, a plane that was an, um, a medical plane. So it had ORs on it, it had post-op, pre-op, and training seats in the front where they could video the surgery from the back. And so we asked Pat Robertson if we could use the plane. Hmm. Because uh, let, let us think about that. That's a big item, you know. It, it's a um, what is it? A um, seven, seven twenty-seven or seven? The big mm -hmm. aircraft. Mm -hmm. So um, he finally came to us. He said, "You've got it." I'm like, oh, "Okay, that's that's cute." <laughs> that's what I said to my husband. That's a good idea. How how? Because they gave us nothing. Where's the steps? Where's the landing rights? Where's the everything that goes with the plane? How about the gas? So we we had to figure those things out. But at the end, I think it brings everybody together. Everybody's got to have a part of that. You know, we were working with some of Exxon Mobil, uh, Chevron. So we were like, all right, you guys start calling them and see if they'll give us gas when we land. And, you know, then landing rights. So our countries are very connected. So they helped us get all that. I mean, it was a lot. But mm -hmm. in the end, it was very successful because what happened? We did get that noise we wanted. The presidents of the countries came on. They wanted to see what was going on. We were like, this is great because they should know the needs of these children in their country. So we had presidents of country coming on. We had press. The corporate came on. So they gave us more money. It was called the journey of hope. And so that was in 1999. It was a lot. It was an idea. Like I say, an idea is an, only an idea until it's implemented. And so we were able to do that. I have, I like the getting into the nitty gritty and my husband likes the ideas. So different personalities can work together. Um, and that, that works in families. Um, mm -hmm. And our kids had different you know, exercises to perform. My one son is a surgeon out in LA. So he does cleft lip and cleft palate. You know, he can join. My other son's a businessman. My other son's a surgeon. The, the girls have their um, backgrounds in nursing and psychology. So everybody could join and make this possible. It was in extraordinary. Actually, we can send you the clip on that and you might pop that clip on. Because you can see the presidents coming on or people lining up to get on. We landed, but we also worked in that hospital in that country. So we were able to do 5,000 surgeries in that in those nine weeks. Wow, so it's, it's do really those big, hairy, big, audacious big goals. goals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big goals. Yeah, that was a big that's one. It. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's because uh, I mean, I think you, you know, you mentioned a bit about having these these big goals and 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 president working with presidents in different countries, and and I think I guess if you needed any uh, uh, any clarification that you were doing the right thing, you know, obviously two thousand nine, winning one of the America's best leaders from President George W. Bush at that time. I mean, that must have been um, um yeah, pretty pretty crazy a year for you, I guess, you know, I mean, it's kind of it just proof that you're, you're doing the right thing, if you like. Yeah, I mean, the awards are something. I mean, it, it was a pleasure being with the Bushes because, you know, they're a family. Senior Bush, Junior, they're they're a nice family and they work together. So, you know, I think maybe them seeing this and seeing how we're bringing the world together um, was the credit. 
that we were able to get that award. So it was everybody, though, I can tell you, that <laughs> created a ruckus around the world. But everybody jumped in, and it was great. Everybody felt good about it, right? We took care of 5,000 children in those nine weeks. It's a, it's a lot of surgery, and we have to be very careful. It was all safe, quality work, and that's what we're we're really focused on that. We will not just take anyone uh, on these teams. They're, they are searched out and they have definitely had experience with doing a lot of cleft lip and cleft palates. I mean, is it, is it quite challenging to keep manage the emotions and the emotional side of things because well i know i've i've heard i've watched an interview with yourself and bill talking about the strong emotions you you go through um you know when you're going on the missions but also running the, the business and i think you know obviously because it's something you're very passionate about it's something where well, there's so many emotions not just for you your family but the the patients their families with everybody involved mm -hmm. such emotions that you know when you're looking at the business side you know you mentioned it it's, i mean it's not not easy to get these things going you know the, these kind of things you've done you know uh, the, the you've, you've given the the highlights of, of of what you achieve but i guess getting up to that point there's a lot of things that, that don't work out you know you you want things to get from a to b as quickly as possible and if it was easy everybody would do it but it's not easy to do it so does it make the emotions even it, it kind of magnifies the emotions because you're working in most of business anyway you've started yeah, the company yeah. you, you can see you've got this massive vision and then something goes wrong and, and there's nothing you can do to control and you think well I've, yeah i've got to either change my goal or we've got to uh yeah reevaluate re 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 things so does it how do you manage the, those emotions as part of this really well, I, I just do a little story because there's a lot of emotion on all these uh, programs, all these missions, because it's a mother that's or a father that's just desperate. We're it or they're not. It's not going to happen. So I was. This was one of our first trips to Vietnam. We were the first Americans in after the war, and I'm walking through the hallway, and this mother motions to me. Of course, I'm not speaking that language, but I know she wants something. Go in the room. Um, the child is about seven days old and she's trying to spoon feed it with some water, a little milk. And I'm like, oh, boy, that child is not going to make it. And that, that's very emotional for us to say that is that child is going to die right in front of our face. And we do not want that. So I went to the team and they were like, what are you talking about? We can never put that child under anesthesia. That child is not going to it's not going to work. The, she, the child's not going to make it. So I was like, all right, well, let's just think about it. Let's think. And so the whole team is emotional around one child. But at the end of the day, the dentists, we have dentists on all our teams because a lot of uh, structure with the teeth. And so the dentist said, I have an idea. I'm like, okay, let us hear you. And he said, I'm going to make an obturator. And that's a little appliance that you put in the roof of the mouth so it blocks the hole if you have a palate so the child can eat. And I was like, well, okay, that's great. And so um, he said, I'm, I'm, I don't know what else to do. And the team said, I don't know what else either. So he said, I'm doing it. A seven day old, you're making, you have to put, you know, an appliance in, you have to, it's very small. Anyway, fast forward, we're finishing that trip. And he said, I've got it. I've got the obturator. OK, so that's going to block. So hopefully that child can eat. We'll block the roof of the mouth. So the whole team, think of how emotional this is. The whole team forms around this bed as he puts this obturator in the child's mouth. It fits perfectly. And the mom can really start feeding that child, you know, with a bottle. And we're like, well, that is the best we can do. So we hope that child will be fed and we can finally do the surgery. And guess what? One year later, when we went back, the first people on that line were that mother and that fat little one-year-old, and we did that surgery. It's mm. very emotional because it's a life. It mm. doesn't matter if it's just one. It's a life that was saved because of one person's ability to make a change in mm. what that child needed so that surgery could be done. Amazing. It was amazing for all of us because the surgeons were like, 
that's not working for us. But the dentist said, I've got an idea. So like I said, you have an idea, but can you implement it? And he did. He made that operator and made it fit. That child ate all year. We were able to do the surgery. Boom. You don't need that operator anymore. So anyway, it's a full team, a full emotion that goes on every day during these trips. Uh, uh. I really want you to join. Paul. Yeah, the, uh, I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm in. It was one of those things that I was speaking to your your team in the UK about uh, about uh, th three or four months ago, saying, "Okay, I want to try and get involved in this." So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely definitely in with that. And uh, as I say, if I can get my my son along as well, that'll be that'll be awesome. I think that it'd be just uh, yeah, brilliant to see. You know, I've heard a lot about the the work that is done over there and uh, through obviously the, the different people, operations files, some of the surgeons there, and it uh, it just sounds like um yeah a, a really yeah, amazing thing to go and see but also very yeah very very emotional i think i'm gonna need to take plenty of tissues with me i think on those on that kind of trip i think i'll break down in front of everyone really but uh but yeah but that, i suppose that that's the, you know that kind of thing that you've explained there that 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 just keeps you wanting to push and do more you know i mean i think yeah. that that's um yeah every time you see that there is extra motivation to keep taking things to the next level really i guess and and you know it shows that it's not it's a surgery it's a dental we do also follow those kids with speech um you know and also nutrition to make sure they're eating properly and you know it's you know the moms are eating properly so they don't you know have issues with malnutrition that's very important to us so we follow through with these kids it's not just we do surgery and we're done those every one of those countries have um clinics where those kids come back to and they do the follow-up on them so so important to just follow up and make sure they're going to be okay for life and i mean you obviously you mentioned uh, earlier on about the you know the, the great team that you have the volunteers that are involved mm -hmm. but i I mean, I, I, I'm guessing here, but I guess there's, there's the, you, could, you, you could always do with more volunteers, you know, I mean, I suppose on every mission you go on, you, you know, I, I suppose, unfortunately, you can't help everybody on every mission. There's always going to be people that you run out of time or resources to be able to help. So Correct. the more the more volunteers, the skill set you have mm -hmm. in and, and fundraising and so on, it, it's always going to be you know, beneficial, you know, to keep that, that mission moving forward, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, the volunteers are, they're key. If you, when we take, say, yourself and any donors on a trip, they look at the surgery that's being done, right? That child has a life. But they say, your volunteers are incredible. They are, take care of their children like they're their own. They pick them up. They hug them. They make sure they're comfortable. This is a scary spot handing your child into an operating room that you've never seen before and they trust it's a lot of trust that they give us and so we have to do it the correct way volunteers are always necessary and we're really having volunteers we, we have different programs now and one of the, one of them is called the champions these are volunteers that have been with us for many, many years, we've asked them to come in and help train. Now, the medical people that are in these district hospitals because they need the training. So excellent trainers coming to our district hospital, medical people training, training, training so that we have the best that we are going to give that so people have good health care. It, it's about health care. Like I said, 85 percent of people have no health care um in the world so that and then we have had uh, another program because we see a lot of women are in healthcare, and we need more if we're really gonna you know address 85 percent of the world you need more so we're pushing on women in medicine and we've had four all women in medicine trips missions uh we were able to find them from everywhere surgeons anesthesia biomedical and we did for one in Africa, one in um, on South America, uh, in Peru, one in the Philippines, and let's see, we did Malawi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, we were able to get them. They're there. And now we're driving on more education. We've gotten some scholarship money to train more women to go into medicine and to take leadership positions. They, they can take positions that help lead and guide the rest. So we're really pushing on that. Women in medicine, the champions, these are new programs that we're moving forward so that we can really expand what we're doing for the future. And, and it's great to see. I mean, obviously, the the, the subject of diversity and inclusion is well mm -hmm. spoken mm -hmm. about on, on, in different com companies and on platforms like LinkedIn and so on. And I think, uh, yeah, the the more that uh, you know, the companies like yourselves and others can do to to to, to highlight that and and get more you know, women involved in these uh, positions, then then I think it's good. It's good to see because you know, it's uh, yeah. I think that as soon as a few people start doing it, then the yeah the ball starts rolling and more and people realize why oh, i can do that and uh, yeah try to they can learn the skills in order to to get involved as well and um i mean uh, the question i was gonna we would just before we hit record uh, today we were talking a bit off air about about yourself really you were talking about inspirational women in uh, in in their roles and you know i was asking you you're still doing a lot of travel and uh, i think the answer is, is definitely yes so you're still as motivated driven and full of energy as ever we're going back to 1982 so that's fully driven and motivated as you were then <laughs> yeah no it's um it's interesting because you know we took care originally the one child we were so happy to do that to get the volunteers the commitment for training the equipment but then when i i was in um, rwanda lately amazing what this country has done you know for their people and i had a meeting with the president president kagami and he said all i want for my people is best health care well that's easy then for him he'll have an economy because people can work they're healthy they can take care of things and you know we learn things from these trips they have a day where they do cleaning one day a week one day a month i'm sorry we got there on cleaning day what's that i don't know what that is okay so we went to the hospital and they handed us mops and you know dusting rags, and we clean the ORs. Everybody in that country stops for one day and cleans. They don't care what you clean. So there's no, you know, there's no papers on the street. The tree, trim, everything is trimmed. Honestly, I was like, this is amazing that what people can do together to make their country the best. So that's a great example of what people can do. And I, I think the U.S. ought to try that one. <laughs> Mm, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's trying to get uh, kids cleaning in the US. That would be an interesting one, right? That's, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like the yeah, idea, the though. I'd, I'd like that in the UK as well. I'd like that in our house. So that, like, yeah, the, yeah, in our house. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that inspires me to meet with a president of a country and say, all I want is health care. And then when I met with the Minister of Health, he said, could you help us? We have no intensive care. Yes, we can. So we'll drive to get new things in that country so they have better medical care um and the training that goes with that so that and and the students i was just with these high school students that trained for trips they're going on india malawi madagascar uh peru they're, they're morocco they're going all over the place they were so excited these are kids high school students that have now instead of doing something else, right? Using your phone all day. They've committed to go on these trips, but they have to do a lot before they go. We have a conference every summer. They were part of the conference. They have a club in their school. So these kids are committed to give back and to really share what they have, their talents to a child in a country. And it'll be so beneficial to them and to the child they touch. Um, we had a um, a staff who was in one of our countries and she got in we have a child life area we get the kids to start playing because they've never played before so they and we get them calm so they're ready for the or and then when the child was ready to go to the or this staff spends so much time with this child instead of taking the mother's hand to walk to the or he turned to the staff and took her hand and they walked in and she handed that child into that operating room. So, you know, lots of emotion, like you say, but 
important to be part of the team and to give back. People have so many talents these days. Mm. And we can connect. This phone is a connector worldwide. Mm -hmm. So, yep, we do a lot with emotion. We do a lot with talent, time, you know, and the treasure you have to share with others. I think, I think to be honest, that's a great way to, to end the show, really. I think I can't think of other, other quotes to, to finish on, really, Cathy. I think, and, and just to say a huge thank you for your, your time today. I know that you're really busy. There's a lot of things going on. And I yeah, really appreciate you, the time you spent uh, with, with myself. I know the network will take a lot from it. And and, and clearly, you know, we're, we're helping to promote the book, the Slope of the Slope book as well, which uh, yes. with, uh, which I've written for, uh, for Operation Smile. And, uh, and I know you've written some really nice words for the book as well, which are really great grateful for. So yeah, huge thank you for going through all this. But more importantly, a huge thank you for really everything you've done, you know, since starting Operation Smile. I mean, the, the lives you've changed uh, and yeah. the impact you've had on on their families and and, uh, and people in general. I mean, it, it's, it can't be it can't be calculated, really, the, the impact you've had. So a huge thank you to yourself and to, to Bill, obviously, for uh, for starting it all up and, and for the impact that you've made uh, across mm -hmm. the world. So yeah, just massive mm -hmm. thanks uh, for that. Yeah, we say it's been an honor for us. You know, we have met so many people, uh, so many lives changed, so many um, students who started with us 40 years ago have come back to us to do things either surgically, you know, or uh, a lot of these students go into public health after that. So it's helpful to the future. We see a lot from what what we have done, but we are honored to be a part of this whole thing. Thank you for listening to this episode of the EMEA Recruitment Podcast. You can find Paul's book, Sloth Are the Sloth, for sale through Amazon, with all profits going to Operation Smile. For more information on Operation Smile's work, please visit operationsmile.org.